and our next speaker is Elena Marx. And she's presenting linking linguistic and cognitive approaches to avenge construal interpretation interpretation of a temporal order in English relative clauses is driven by event structures. Yeah. Um, thank you for the introduction and thanks for having me. Um, so the question that we were interested in is how do we get from linguistic form to knowing when something something ha happens. So, for instance, if I tell you that the boy pets the chicken every Thursday, you will uh, every Friday, you will probably look into your calendar or you will look on your watch and say, well, that's easy. It's Friday, so the boy probably pets the chicken today. And you will do so because languages have these lexical means to convey this information, such as every Friday. Now, if I tell you that the boy is petting the chicken, you will infer that this is a currently ongoing action. And you will infer so because um, of this grammatical device called aspect here realized as uh, the English progressive. So you can see there are different ways of how we learn about the temporal structure of events from language. Um, but today I only want to focus on one of these devices which has equivalents in many languages of the world, namely the simple past. So if you hear a sentence such as the boy petted the chicken, uh, what can you tell me about the temporal structure of this event? Well, your answer may look somehow like this. So there is this event where a boy pets a chicken, and we know from the past tense morpheme that this event happened at some point prior to now. But oftentimes we do not only talk about simple events, we talk about complex events such as speech act reports, the boy said that the chicken was next to the fence, or we describe entire situations such as the boy petted the chicken that was next to the fence. So here in both cases, we have two events. Uh, we don't have explicit linguistic information when these two events happened. Um, so the question arises, how do we actually know how the, each of these two events uh, temporally relate to one another? One theoretical account would argue that we can derive temporal structure from syntax. And uh, looking at the structural trees, you can see that complement clauses are arguments of the verb phrase describing the speech act. Whereas relative clauses are adjuncts of nouns. And since adjuncts, unlike um, arguments, are not mandatory as they do not complete the meaning of the constituent that they are attached to, this structural difference has been argued to have major consequences on our temporal interpretations. So while complement clauses, um, for royal in complement clauses, uh, the embedded events of the chicken being next to the fence can never happen after the boy talks about it. Um, we are much freer in our temporal interpretations um, of relative clauses. So here, all three logical possibilities of temporal order should, in theory, be possible interpretations of these past and the past relative clauses. So the chicken being next to the fence could either happen prior to the petting event, it could be simultaneously with it, or it could even happen after um, the boy pets it, as long as both of these events remain past relative to the utterance time. There is another theory answering to this question, namely we could also say, well, people might take event structure as a starting point for deriving temporal structure from linguistic descriptions. On such an account, um, each temporal expression, such as a past tense morpheme, evokes a complex temporal structure in the mind of the comprehender involving several temporal parameters. Um, one of these temporal parameters is a so-called temporal anchor, which you can generally think of as a reference time. Um, what is important here is that temporal anchors often relate to salient events. Um, now, why is this important? Because we know from event cognition literature that there is this fundamental difference between events and states in terms of cognitive saliency, where events are cognitively more salient than states. So in consequence, um, this would predict that comprehenders um, tend to um, identify events as the temporal anchor of states. Now, where does this leave, uh, leave us with our past in the past relative clauses? So in a sentence such as the boy petted the chicken that was next to the fence, comprehenders should identify the petting event at, as it is more salient as the temporal anchor of the state of the chicken being next to the fence, which would exclude this last possibility of temporal order because here the temporal anchor precedes the anchored state. 
from a structure driven account, on the other hand, there is no reason why any of these um, orders um, or these possibilities of temporal order should be more or less acceptable um, as temporal interpretations of past and the past relative clauses. So in order to tease these two accounts apart, we have to ask ourselves, does this last possibility of temporal order reflect how people interpret past and the past relative clauses? And we investigated this question in 14 experiments following this general design. So we first showed participants one of two event sequences. We then gave them a relative clause description or a wild clause description in a control condition. And we asked them to rate how well they thought the linguistic description matched the previously seen event sequence. And crucially, these event sequences were videos that, that were manipulated in a certain way. So. Um, the um, state in the relative clause was either backshifted relative to the event in the matrix clause event, which you can see here. So first the chicken is next to the fence, and then the boy pets it. Or the relative clause state was forward shifted relative to the matrix clause event. So here the boy first pets the chicken, no. and then it is next to the fence. So, and uh, participants saw eight of these critical trials as well as 16 pillar trials and four sanity checks. Now, what are our predictions? So what you can generally see in these graphs on the X axis is which video sequence uh, participants saw, so either backshifted or forward shifted, and on the Y axis, how acceptable they thought the match between the linguistic description and the video was, uh, where high, bar means, uh, high bars mean that they uh, like the match and low bar means um, that they uh, didn't find the match very fitting. And uh, from a structure-driven account, we would predict that both event sequences, but both backshifted and forward-shifted, should be uh, acceptable for relative clauses, but unacceptable for while clauses, because while generally encodes that something happens simultaneously. From an event structural account, on the other hand, we would expect the graphs to look like this, so the forward shifts should be significantly less acceptable than the back shifts. And uh, while these predictions, of course, show our raw, uh, show, show, show raw data, um, we also ran a statistical analysis, so we use mixed effect models as well as planned pairwise comparison. And this is what we found in two experiments with uh, native English and native German speakers. As you can see, the pattern of results looks exactly as predicted by the event structural account. Now, you may have noticed that in our videos of the forward shift, the chicken goes to the fence and stays there, and then the screen went blank and participants read the sentence that they then had to write. So one possibility why um, forward shifts were less acceptable could have been that participants did not perceive the state of, of the chicken of being next to the fence as fully in the past. So they may have detected a mismatch between the past tense and the relative clause and what they actually saw. And to check for this possibility, we ran another version of the experiment, but this time we used videos where the state in the forward shifts was unambiguously terminated. So this time the boy petted the chicken, the chicken went to the fence, and then it flew away. And we found a similar pattern of results, excluding this alternative explanation. Now, you may have also noticed that we um, always included a second character referent in our uh, videos. So another alternative explanation may have been that in order to identify the right vid, um, uh, referent in the videos, participants thought that the um, description of the relative clause would have needed to be true at the time of the matrix clause event, which is not the case for forward shifts, right? So in order to check for this alternative explanation, we ran another version of the experiment without the second character and uh, again found our uh, pattern of results. Um, again, excluding this alternative explanation. Now I want to draw your attention to the um, x-axis of all of these graphs. As you can see, participants generally rated um, event sequences higher where the relative clause was ordered first, um, um, as opposed to event sequences where the matrix clause was ordered first. So this could, of course, also have been just a particular strategy, a syntactic strategy, which ha would have nothing to do with the event type that is encoded uh, in those clauses, right? So to check for this possibility, we ran another version of our experiment following this general design, but this time we contrasted um, relative clauses that entailed a state, so the boy petted the chicken that was next to the fence, with sentences where the activity was encoded by the relative clause. 
So the chicken that the boy petted was next to the fence. Um, let's look at our predictions. So from a structure-driven account, uh, none of these manipulations should make any difference. So um, both event sequences should be highly acceptable to comprehenders, um, regardless of the event type that is encoded by the relative clause. More interestingly is whether uh, participants would employ a relative clause first strategy. Here we would expect a main effect of event sequence where back shifts are always rated higher um, than forward shifts. And from an event structural account, we would expect a pattern to look like this. Uh, so here uh, we would expect this um, interaction where forward shifts become more acceptable um, in combination with relative clauses uh, with an activity because here the activity, so the temporal anchor, again follows the anchored state. And this is what we found in two experiments. So we found this interaction uh, in, uh, as well in the German data as well as in the English data. And uh, to check for uh, the influence of reference resolution, we again ran another version of the experiment without the second character and replicated our findings. Now, if you look at the example sentences um, below the graphs, you can see that we did not only manipulate the event type of the relative clause, but also its position in the sentence. Um, and we did so to keep the semantic content of both sentences constant. But um, putting a linguistic constituent to the front also puts it into linguistic focus. So we may have detected a saliency difference in our data that would have nothing to do with the event type manipulations that we actually did. So in order to control for this possibility, we ran uh, another version of the experiment, but this time we kept uh, the relative clause um, in default position, um, th and this time we changed the semantic content of the sentences. So the contrast this time was the boy petted the chicken that was next to the fence versus the boy was next to the chicken that hopped towards or away from the fence. And this is what we found. Uh, so we still found two significant interactions, but we also found these two main effects of sentence type. So the question is, what happened here? Now, if you look at um, the video or the linear order between uh, the video and the sentence for the backshifted event sequence combined with the relative clause with a state, so the lower blue bar, um, you can see that the linear order doesn't match. Whereas if you look at the higher uh, green bar, um, that is um, the forward shift combined with the relative clause with an activity, you can see that both uh, the linear order of video and sentence does match. So what these main effects of sentence type may reflect is that linear order enhances but not hinders the event structural effect effects that we previously found um, in our experiments. And then finally, we asked what would happen in the absence of event structural differences. Would people here employ a particular strategy of ordering relative clauses always first? And this time, the contrast was um, uh, sentences uh, that contain two states and sentences that contain two activities. So the boy was next to the chicken that was next to the fence was contrasted with the boy petted the chicken that hopped to or away from the fence. Now, um, if participants would indeed um, employ a relative clause first strategy, we would again expect this main effect of event sequence where back shifts are always more um, acceptable than forward shifts. Um, from an event structural perspective, we would expect the pattern to look like this, uh, where um, uh, double activity sentences are um, rated higher than double state activity, uh, st double state sentences. And this has to do with the observation that states tend to receive an overlapping um, interpretation as they extend in time. And um, from a structure-driven account, uh, we, it is not entirely clear what they would uh, predict. Like, so strictly speaking, um, the pattern should look like this. So none of these manipulations, again, should make any difference. However, the observation that states tend to receive overlapping interpretations was also made by the semantic literature. So in this case, um, the predictions of the structure-driven account might, in fact, uh, match the um, predictions of the event structural account. And this is also uh, the pattern that we found in our data. Now, what happens if language doesn't tell us what happens when? Well, it seems like people have strong intuitions regarding temporal order um, that is based on what they know about states and events in the world. So one of these intuitions is that states are the backgrounds of events. And the other one is 
that states tend to receive an overlapping interpretation with other states or events. Now, why is this interesting? Because our findings in the temporal domain resonate with other phenomena where we know that people use non-linguistic backup strategies um, to make inferences during language comprehension. So one example would, for instance, be an agent first uh, strategy where uh, we have the strong intuition that the first constituent mentioned is also the agent of a sentence. And usually we use this intuition to assign semantic roles accordingly. What our data now shows is that we have similar, um, thank you, uh, that we have similar um, uh, strategies in the event domain, namely what we know about temporal order is based on what we know about the internal structure of events. And interestingly, um, linear order, even though um, it is oftentimes a very reliable cue to a uh, temporal sequence, did only play a minor role in our data. Now, why is, this, um, why is this research interesting? For one thing, we provide a method that allowed us um, to show how or to investigate how event structure maps onto linguistic descriptions of complex events. And more importantly, we were able to collect first data showing that there is this systematic interaction between two cognitive systems, that is event structure and language when it comes to temporal interpretations. Secondly, um, focusing on relative clauses allowed us to separate temporal order um, that is grounded in event structural differences um, from other factors which have been shown to influence temporal interpretations. So one of these factors I already mentioned throughout the talk is um, linear order, but the other one that will become increasingly important in our future research is causality. So if you look at a sentence such as Mary raised a boy that was in my course, you probably get a very strict or a very strong forward shifted interpretation of that sentence where Mary first, so the, the event in the main clause happens first, Mary first raises the boy and then the boy is in my course. Now the question is why is the forward shift here um, the default interpretation? And one possible explanation could be that in order to partake in an academic course, you need to be raised first, right? So here, um, the um, causal connection between the two events could in fact override the interpretations that arise from the event structural properties. And finally, um, our methods are a means to dig deeper into this question, uh, what distinguishes states and events. So while um, our, we only used very prototypical examples of states and events that are, were all also very inspired by the event cognitive literature, um, future uh, research should um, also include, um, for instance, very stative um, events or uh, rather eventive states um, to kind of push ahead on the question, what makes a state a state and what makes an event an event? And that's it from my side. Thank you. Okay, questions? Hi, uh, Bjorn Lundqvist, University of Tromsø. Uh, mm. It's very interesting. There's a lot of things to keep track of. Uh, so, yeah, I want to continue where you ended. Uh, so you looked at now uh, simple past tense, yes. but you started discussing the, the, the progressive as well. And some people would claim that the progressive is a derived state, like the Parsons theory, so like progressive states, derived states. And what, what do you think would, I mean, it would be interesting to look at them. What do you think would happen if you do something like the boy was petting uh, the chicken that was next to the fence? Do you believe that people are looking for the the lexical semantics of verbs, or do they look at the, say, the high-level uh, aspects? Hmm. Um, so, but you would uh, contrast, or you would use sentences that both contain, uh, so where the, the, the aspect marking is both in the main clause and the relative. Right, I mean, you could, of course, do what you, what you did towards the end. You can say the boy was petting the chicken that jumped over the fence, right, where you have, mm -hmm. say, a derived state. Yeah upstairs and then uh, 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 sort of uh, an event in the relative clause. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I 
I don't actually know what, uh, it's an empirically open question, yeah, yeah, so yeah. it will be very interesting to kind of implement, because we only looked at tens, and of course aspect is, a very, is another huge aspect that we, uh, we, we should look at, um, or which this research kind of could be, uh, could integrate. Um, I guess um, if we use um, two aspect markings in both the main clause and the relative clause, I'm not entirely sure whether our results would be that different, because again, we do not have different information as to when or how things happen. So I think that the results may look somehow like our, our results, but it might be different. It might also be the case that I'm a German speaker, so I don't have the right yeah. intuitions as to aspect marking, but yeah, that would be, does that answer your question? That would be interesting to, okay. to check. Yeah, yeah. sure. Thanks. Thank you so much for the great talk. I have Jack Duff, UC Santa Cruz. Um, you mentioned causality at the end and whether it might sometimes be overriding uh, the sort of more temporally driven or event driven things that uh, you were looking at. But I'm wondering if you think that the critical uh, state always located before event effect that you find might potentially have an explanation in just the causal domain without uh, resorting to the anchoring, um, the, the, the sort of way of going about it that I was thinking might be plausible uh, was related to the presence of agentive uh, participants in the two events. So, and, and this might be wrong, uh, just based on the, the stimuli that you gave, it looked like the event participants, or the, what you have as eventive, always had a, a, an agentive participant, and, and yeah. the, the states maybe often or, or always lacked that. And if that was true, then, then you might construct a story where you like states to, to provide explanations for, for things that have events in them. And, and that might not be related to the actions art but instead to, to these causal properties. I don't know if it's plausible for all your data, but I wanted to know if you had any thoughts. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I haven't thought about that yet. So your, your point is that in the one um, part we have is an object and in the state we don't? Uh, no, but Because about that would be, um, I mean, we use that to kind of create relative clauses, right? So another way to go from here would be to look at examples that are not um, relative clauses, but for instance, look at discourse and how here states and event kind event structure may kind of factor into temporal interpretations. And that's actually a line of research that we're heading uh, into. With regards to uh, causality or the example that I gave, I'm not entirely sure whether causality is actually the factor here either. Yeah. Because if you look at the word uh, raised, it's kind of also relates to the, my last point, right? That raised is kind of a very stative event. It happens over a long time. Of course, it's kind of a change of state. But the question here is whether the duration of states and events is kind of more a decisive factor of how events and states are perceived and whether this is actually the reason why we get this forward shift. Because the raising uh, part is kind of a more stative even though it is an event in the linguistic literature, um, but it seems more stative than the being in my course. Does that answer your question? Yes, okay. I, I think so, at least part of it. Could I, could I add a like, more pointed question about the, the yes, items? Of course. Um, of course. So, so the, the thing that I was noticing was that you always have this, the boy petted uh, the chicken, and, and that always had, so it was more about the subjects than the objects, mm. but the subject of, of petted is always going to be someone that is acting with intention, whereas the the mm -hmm. kind of states you used were always states that where the subject didn't necessarily ah, yeah, uh, okay. but but no, is that no, true across all your items do you have any yeah. items where the subject of the state might be uh someone that was explicitly doing something uh, uh we didn't include that in our stimuli but that's a very good point which i will take home thank you okay well thank you so much yeah. hi elena hi um so oh yeah so i'm josh hartshorn from boston college um so it's a very impressive uh, series of experiments. I wanted to ask you about, um, I wanted to push you on uh, your interpretation of your event structure hypothesis, mm -hmm. right? Which is, I think that you are interpreting this as like deriving from um, non-linguistic, you know, representation of the world, right? Yes. But there's another thing going on here too, right? Which is even given a particular non-linguistic representation of the world, when we're communicating, we have to decide what to describe and in what order. Um, and is it possible that what you're actually catching are um, discourse practices that, um, you know, for instance, might actually, uh, you know, be be learned and variable across um, across cultures? Mm. 
Um, yes, so in a way, yes, it, it might be the case, especially because I don't think that people use relative clauses to communicate explicitly about the temporal order of events. So um, I, um, hmm, how do I answer this <laughs> question? So um, I think what we were trying to show is how do people, because we constantly have to form representations of the things that we comprehend, right? And one of these dimension is always a temporal dimension. And how do people um, kind of create or generate this temporal dimension, even though this is oftentimes very, very implicit. implicit. And um, so, I'm not sure whether I, I answered your question or that kind of goes into the direction that answers your question. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. We have time for more questions. Or we could wrap up for lunch. <laughs> uh, let's thank Lena again. Thank you.